ಪ್ರತಿದಾತಿ ಯೋ ವೈ ವೇದಾಂಶ ಪ್ರಹಿಣೋತಿ ತಸ್ಮೈ ತಂ ಹೇವ ಆತ್ಮಬುದ್ಧಿ ಪ್ರಕಾಶ ಭೂಮುಕ್ಷೂರ್ವೈ ಶರಣಮಹಂ ಪ್ರಪದ್ಯೇ we who seek liberation take refuge in that infinite light which illumines the hearts of all which is the source of the creator himself and who gave forth the infinite knowledge of veda om shanti 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 hi hari hi om tat sat om peace 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 be unto us all so good morning everyone and this morning uh i'm starting a new series not a weekly series but maybe once a month as uh, the schedule of the month allows uh on the different small texts of uh, vedanta so again this is not going to be a class uh, but it is going to be uh, a talk on a particular text the lagu vakya vritti uh which means the lagu of course means a simple or the short or the condensed of uh, uh really the light uh light is in light and weight lagu of course as most of you know uh vakya statement and vritti commentary because vritti has many meanings but here it means a commentary uh, bhashya is a long commentary the, whose purpose is to uh establish a philosophy and so the bhashyas of shankaracharya they're not merely commentaries on uh, the upanishads or on the brahma sutras or uh, on the gita but their purpose is to establish a philosophy and argue against other philosophies but avritti is a commentary on the text itself it just deals with the text and so this the lagu vakya avritti is a uh, simple or short uh, commentary on the mahavakya aham brahmasmi i am brahman uh, so this belongs to a class of texts in vedanta called prakarana grantha prakarana grantha Uh, prakarana grantha is a sh- uh, usually a short text uh in fact i think they're all short texts but some are longer than others but all of them short dealing with a particular aspect of uh, vedanta philosophy and so another one we will take up in time is panchi karanam uh which in the title the title the title or what is meant referred to by the title is not of great uh value but the text itself is much more than that and the text itself is a very good text panchi karanam refers to the process by which the five subtle elements of creation become the five gross elements of uh, creation and so it's a technical uh subject which doesn't have much practical value for us the five elements do understanding them uh but not the uh quintuplication of the elements uh, but the text panchi karanam uh, deals with other things which are of high value as well and so text that uh, some of you know uh at least by name uh, and reputation like the drishya viveka the discrimination between the seer and the seen those of you who are fans of swami sarvapriyananda will know that that's one of his main texts Uh, he has uh, videos on youtube uh, and many places he speaks on uh, drigdrishya viveka another one of his favorite texts is also a prakarana grantha called aparokshanubhuti uh direct or immediate uh, experience and so the prakarana granthas are again a class of texts which deal with a particular subject in vedanta so again i'm not going to take take up a class which uh, even a text like this which is just 18 verses uh, would take a couple of uh, lectures to discuss completely so uh, i'm not going to do that i will do it uh, briefly and uh, so uh, uh, the uh, some of the other texts 100 or more verses of course that would uh, obviously take uh, more uh, explanation 
So uh, the Lanaguvakya Vritti is a text which is said to be composed by Shankaracharya. I myself doubt that. Uh, one reason for doubting it is that uh, Shankaracharya could not possibly have written the number of texts that are attributed to him. There are many, many, many texts attributed to him, and he only lived uh, according to tradition for 30 years. Uh, and even a prolific writer wouldn't have written all of the texts that he wrote, besides the fact that he was traveling all over India, walking over in those days all over India, uh, arguing, uh, 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 entering into our philosophical arguments and so forth. And so uh, we uh, can't attribute to him the number of texts that are attributed to him. But another reason for believing that this is not a text by Shankaracharya is that it discusses things that became questions only in later Vedanta, uh, after the time of Shankaracharya. One of the things you find with philosophy is its tendency to become more complicated. As you look into a philosophical point more and more, you see that, well, it doesn't quite fit. So you begin to make adjustments to make it fit. Um, there's a corresponding tendency among devotees in the path of bhakti marga, and that is the tendency to go on complicating rituals. You do a simple ritual, a simple offering of the heart to worship, and then you think, well, I could add in a little bit more, do these other things. I could add in the pancha devatas and worship them also. And then instead of just offering five things, I could offer 10 things. Well, instead of offering 10 things, I could offer 16 things. And instead of just offering them, I can do all of these purifications, and uh, then I can also do all of these nyasas and uh, things all over the body. So pretty soon, uh, you have tied yourself up in knots with complications in rituals. And uh, so the corresponding uh, tendency in the path of jnana marga, uh, or even for devotional philosophers, but the corresponding uh, tendency in philosophy is to go on complicating philosophy. And again, the main reason for philosophy, this is where it differs from the tendency in bhakti, is that no philosophy really exactly matches experience. Experience is, uh, it overflows the bounds of philosophy. Philosophy tries to put things in conceptual boxes so that everything fits together and it's like making a flow chart. It's the difference between a flow chart and actual work. You can put a flow chart and uh, have every, uh, the way that everything is going to uh, work out and one thing leading to another and this leading to three results and those leading to these other uh, uh, projects and so forth. But then you find that you're dealing with actual people and people don't follow flow charts. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you have temperaments of people and uh, personality difficulties and, com uh, and all of those things. So reality doesn't match our maps. Maps are very useful. Otherwise, we would be in trouble without maps, finding our way, because life is too complex to manage without maps. But we have to realize that maps are not the terrain itself. The terrain is infinitely more complicated than the maps. And so life, or existence, I should say, not just life, but existence is far more complicated than philosophy. Philosophy abstracts out principles behind the multiplicity so that we can understand what it is we are seeing. And that's the way all knowledge proceeds. And so uh, let us begin with the Laguvakya Vritti, but again, with that in mind, that uh, though it's attributed to Shankaracharya, I doubt that it was because it brings up uh, issues which were not uh, even considered at the time of Shankaracharya. So of course, that's not conclusive, but uh, it's my conviction. And uh, uh, I will point to that when we come to it in the text. So it begins very simply. I'll read the first verse. It's only 18 verses. Uh, no, also, uh, Jiten Bai was uh, kind enough to find a place online where if you want to see this uh, text, you can uh, see it online at issuu.org. And if you want the exact uh, URL, Jiten Bai can give it to you. Uh, both the Devanagari text and the English translation. So this is uh, Swami Shraddhanandaji, whom many of you uh, met, I'm sure at least some of you knew him, a great Swami who was uh, the head of the Sacramento Center for many years. 
So he translated the 18 verses plus a short uh, commentary on the Logovakya Vritti. So the first verse says, Stulo mam samamaya ma mayo deha, sukshma syad vasana mayaha, jnana karamendriya saradham dhiprano tachari raga. Uh, so this refers to the, this is referring to the uh, gross physical body and the subtle body. In fact, let me read the next verse and I'll take the two together because the next verse, verse two, deals with all three bodies. The stula sharira, sukshma sharira, and karana sharira. Uh, that is the body that we see, the subtle body, which is the mental body, the, including other aspects as well, and then the causal body, the, uh, the source of our manifestation as individuals. So the second verse says, Anyanam karanam sakshi bodhas tesham vibhasakaha bodha bhaso buddhigata kartasya kunya papa yo. So it says that the gross body is this fleshy body. That we don't need anyone to tell us. So we may take classes on physiology and anatomy. Uh, and learn many details about the physical body, but we know what it is. We may not know the detailed analysis, scientific analysis of it, study, uh, but everybody knows what the physical body is, that which we see, that which uh, touches, etc. And it says that uh, uh, the sukshma syad vasana moya, that the subtle body is made of our vasanas. The subtle body is made of our desires and impressions, plus these other things. The senses of knowledge and the senses of action. This is something that you'll find over and over again in uh, Vedanta, in the Upanishads, in the Gita, and in all later texts of Vedanta, the idea of the jnanendriyas, the senses of knowledge. That is, the senses which give us perception. And the karamendriyas, the, the, uh, the uh, organs of action. And uh, so the so senses of knowledge, of course, are the five senses that we're used to. Uh, and the senses of uh, action are the hands for grasping, the feet for uh, locomotion, uh, the mouth for eating and for speaking, uh, the generative organ uh, for procreation, and the evacuation organ. Uh, so those are the organs of action that uh, all, uh, 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 not all, sentient beings, but certainly all higher sentient beings have, not just uh, people. So the subtle body is made, and also it's made of the uh, mind and the five pranas, the vital force. So again, this physical body is just this visible body, that which is operated on by doctors and treated by doctors. But the subtle body is the mind, uh, the lower mind and the higher mind. The mind is said to have four parts, both in yoga and in Sankhya philosophy and in Vedanta, but that's simplified into two parts. Uh, one, the lower mind and the higher mind. The higher mind, the buddhi, uh, the intuitive mind, which is also the repository of the ego, and then the lower mind, which is also uh, associated with the citta, uh, so the manas and the citta. So you can think of that as just the mind in two parts, or the mind in four parts, but it, uh, the subtle body is made up of the mind, the vital force, uh, and the organs of action, and the organs of knowledge. So why the organs of action and the organs of knowledge? Because those are in the physical body. No, they're not in the physical body. The physical body has the physical hand, it has the physical feet, it has the physical mouth, etc. Uh, the physical body has the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, the skin for t uh, touch. But the actual sense organ is associated with the mind inside, as Swami Vivekananda uh, explains in his Raja Yoga and elsewhere. He goes to great lengths to explain this to his audiences. The, the sense organs are uh, mental. The, the physical organ is just the instrument of the internal organ. So what does that mean? That means that sometimes you're sitting in a room. I remember when I was a kid, my grandmother had an old-timey wind-up clock on the mantle of her uh, living room. 
And uh, this was something that puzzled me many times. I would go to her uh, house, we'd go to her house on Sundays uh, to spend the uh, day and evening with her. And when I first got there, this uh, t uh, clock would tick loudly, tock, 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 tock. It would be so loud that you couldn't help but notice it. And then after a while, suddenly I'd realize, my goodness, I haven't heard the clock for a long time. And then suddenly I would hear it again. But my mind was somewhere else. The ear was there. The sound waves were reaching the ear, but I didn't hear anything. That shows that the power to hear is not the ear. The power to hear is uh, in the mind. And so if the mind is dissociated from the physical organ, then you don't hear it. You may be hearing your own thoughts. So hearing is still taking place, but you're hearing your own thoughts, but you're not hearing the sound of the clock. That's faded into uh, oblivion. And so we see that all of the time. Uh, you, uh, uh, you're sitting on the chair, and when you think about it, you can feel, you can feel the chair. You can feel the chair pressing against you. But after a while, if you get absorbed in a book or in a talk or in uh, daydreaming or in thoughts or whatever, suddenly you forget about the fact that the chair is pressing against you. Uh, but then when you think about it, there it is again. Uh, and so with uh, seeing, how many times uh, we have uh, all driven down the road, distracted by some uh, thought or daydream or something, and suddenly we get to our destination and we think, my God, how did I get here? I don't even remember where I was driving, where I turned, what roads I was getting onto. I was just on automatic. And I got here, there are no accidents, but I wasn't paying attention to anything. Uh, maybe I had had in mind before I started that when I pass such and such a place, I want to see if that uh, store is still open or if that has moved. I heard somebody told me that it may have moved. Uh, and we get to our destination and realize, oh, I, did, I didn't even notice anything. I didn't see anything. So even though the eye is functioning enough to drive, uh, but it's barely functioning uh, enough to drive, and that too is on automatic. We don't even remember uh, the roads that we just drove on. And so the power to perceive is uh, in the mind. It's not in the sense organs. So uh, the... Uh, sense organs are mental. Uh, one other proof of that, uh, that fact, that the sense organs are mental, is you've all heard of near-death experiences. Like everything else, it has an acronym, NDE, uh, near-death experience, where people have clinically died and they flatline, uh, maybe on the operating table. And suddenly the person, uh, the person who apparently died uh, feels himself to be up uh, in a corner of the ceiling looking down. The body is dead. They see their body lying there. They see the doctors trying to resuscitate them. They hear the doctors talking. But the body's down here and it's flatlined. There's no mental activity. The heart has stopped. Uh, and they're seeing and hearing from up here. So that means they're seeing and hearing while their eyes and ears are down there. So the ability to perceive uh, is not tied necessarily to the sense organs. So the subtle body is that which goes from life to life. When this body dies, the physical body dies, but you don't die. You are the subtle, you uh, have a subtle body, you're not the subtle body, you're the Atman, but you have a subtle body. And that goes from lifetime to lifetime to lifetime to lifetime until you attain to liberation. And uh, so that is the, uh, the consciousness, individualized consciousness associated with the mind, force, pranas, and of action. But it says, Agnanam Karanam Sakshi. Uh, but Bodha, uh, consciousness, is uh, the, the uh, oh no, first, uh, first it says Agnanam Karanam, that ignorance is the cause of all of this. Ignorance is the cause of the physical body and the subtle body. Out of ignorance comes the, the subtle body and the physical body. So what does that mean? That means that our forgetfulness of who we really are, that we are one with God, that we are the Atman, that forgetfulness is a thing. It's not just the absence of knowledge. Ignorance is actually a, uh, is actually a thing. It's uh, 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 a positive force uh, which causes us to forget. And so uh, the cause of our manifestation as individual beings in the body and mind is ignorance itself. 
And that is seeing in deep sleep. When you are in deep sleep, and you wake up from deep sleep and say, oh my God, I was so sound asleep, I didn't know anything. I had no sense of time, no, I had no, no dreaming, I was just completely gone. How long I was gone, I don't know, I was just completely out of it. Uh, that is the direct experience of ignorance. You don't have any memories of seeing You don't have memories of this. You don't have, uh, uh, you weren't thinking anything. And, uh, but at the same time, you say, when you wake up, anything. I was just gone. Just gone, not knowing anything means what? It means the consciousness was there because that never leaves you. But what was consciousness aware of? It was aware only of the cloud, undifferentiated cloud of ignorance. And so you have no thoughts, you have no ideas, you have no concepts, you have no memories, you have no, even the ego has disappeared. Uh, just consciousness illuminating pure ignorance. And so in deep sleep, you are the closest you ever get in your normal life to the Atman. But it does you no good. It does you no good because you wake up the same person. Again, the subtle body comes in the, in the dream state and then the, the physical body in the waking state. Uh, and so these are the three bodies, the physical body, the subtle body, and the causal body, uh, which, uh, again, we, the, the last of which we experience in deep sleep. So, sakshi bodha stesham vibhasakaha. But the witness of all three of these bodies is consciousness itself, which also is vibhasakaha, the illuminator, that which illuminates the three bodies. So, consciousness illuminates the mind, uh, uh, the sense organs, the body, you uh, touch my physical body, I know I've been touched. Why? Because the body itself is illuminated through the nervous system by consciousness. I'm conscious of my thoughts, my conscious thoughts. How? how? Because they're illuminated by consciousness itself. Thoughts are not conscious by themselves, that's why there's what's called the unconscious mind. Uh, uh, but uh, the consciousness illumines the com conscious mind and it illumines the body. But I'm digesting breakfast probably still right now, but I'm not aware of it, so I'm not conscious of it. Why? Because that is not illuminated by consciousness. That happens in the darkness of ignorance. But my conscious mind and my what I'm paying attention to, that I'm conscious of, because that's illuminated by consciousness. And then there's one more thing to be aware of, and then we can proceed with the more important parts of the text. And that is that there's the reflection of consciousness. And this is not this is what was not that well developed at the time of Shankaracharya. It was only with time that philosophers of Vedanta began to realize that there was a certain problem. I won't go into that because we would never get to the text if I went into that, but there is a certain problem with understanding how consciousness reflected in the mind uh, uh, works. And again, that's because philosophy never completely covers experience. Uh, experience is uh, more complicated than philosophy. Philosophy abstracts from experience a map. And so just as a map is not the terrain, a map of Houston is not so is not experience experience so that it becomes it's true so again there is pure consciousness the Atman, infinite consciousness but why are there so many people why are there so many different if everyone is the same reality why am I in this body you're in that body I have my mind you have your mind and yet the consciousness is one, it said. Consciousness is only one. And yet I have my consciousness, you have your consciousness. I know what's going on in my mind. I don't know what's going on in your mind. And you don't know what's going on in my mind. Probably less than, less than you think. <laughs> so, so there's a, a consciousness. But th that consciousness is reflected in the highest part of the mind. And how that works was the problem that Vedanta philosophers later argued a great deal over, and that this text uh, takes part in that uh, argument. So again, I won't get into that argument because that's not the important part. What we want is the truth which is behind the argument. And so you have the infinite Atman, which is the same in all of us. 
and yet we feel distinct. Why? Because each of us catches a reflection of that infinite self. And it's that which penetrates through the mind and the body and makes the mind seem conscious and the body seem conscious. But my consciousness seems to be separate from your consciousness because I'm dealing with the chidabhasa or, or as it's called here, modhabhasa, the reflected consciousness. So uh, then we come to verse uh, 3. Saiva samsarit karma Vashaloka dvaye sara modha bhasa chuddha bhodam vivichyad ati yatnataha. So it's that modha uh, bhasa, uh, uh, the reflected consciousness along with the uh, uh, subtle body, which goes from life to life. It's that reflected consciousness which goes from lifetime to lifetime. And that's why we have, uh, we have the possibility of recovering past life memories. Not that there's much value in that, but there's a possibility of that. And sometimes someone does suddenly have a memory from a past life. Um, uh, and so, uh, as it says, this, it'll go quicker if I just read the translation here. It is this jiva that is incessantly migrating in the two worlds, meaning... There are more than two worlds, of course, in Vedanta, but this world and the afterworld, that's what's meant. So all of the heavens and hells are collapsed into the other world. So this world and the other world. So it's this reflected consciousness, the mind, the sense powers, and the pranas that go from life to life when this physical body dies. Uh, due, and it says also, due to the force of one's past actions, that we travel from life to life because of the force to force of past actions. Our accumulated karma leads us from birth to birth. Therefore, it says, the supreme problem of life lies in the effort to discriminate pure consciousness from its reflection, that is the jiva. One of the principal things to understand in Vedanta, if you want to go into the philosophical side of Vedanta, is the idea of the jiva, the individual soul, the individual who travels from life to life. Uh, the jiva which we are now, and the jiva which we were in a past life, the jiva we will be in the future life. Liberation comes when we go beyond the jivahood and realize our infinite nature. But as long as we feel that I am an individual separate from everybody else, I am a jiva. And that jiva is the reflected consciousness in the highest part of the mind and everything that follows from that, the subtle body and the physical body, uh, when I'm in a physical body. Uh, and it's that that goes from life to life. And so then in verse uh, 4, it says, Jagara swapna yoreva modha bhasa vidambana supta utitallaye shuddha modho jadhyam prakashaye. This says that the activities of the reflected consciousness, that is, of the jiva, the individual, that reflection of the Atman which is in your uh, the mind of each of us is restricted to the two states of waking and dream. So in the waking state and in the dream state we have the sense of doing things. Right now I'm speaking, you're listening, uh, other people are walking, all, uh, we have the sense of doing things. When we dream we have the uh, sense of doing things as well. So in both the waking state and the dream state we have relational activities. And actually the word used here is much more rich than the what the translator gave. Uh, are the um, the silly, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, silly play acting of the reflected consciousness. So all of the, uh, the waking state and the dream state are the silly play acting of the reflected consciousness. Um, and uh, so that uh, my sense of being an actor, of doing good and bad, uh, that comes from that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, association of consciousness with my mind and ego and this uh, body and uh, subtle body. And then it goes on in the verse, whereas in deep sleep, the reflected consciousness itself with the, together with the reflector, the intellect, being absorbed in ignorance, the pure consciousness shines upon ignorance only. So that's a complicated way of saying uh, that in deep sleep, 
the buddhi itself merges back into ignorance and even the reflection the reflected consciousness merges back into uh, uh, ignorance and that's why in the state of deep sleep we don't have any sense of doing anything of being an agent being an enjoyer of anything just a sense that oh my god i didn't know anything i was just completely uh, zonked out and so it's similar to a state of being knocked unconscious where the mind is just not uh, not functioning uh, there's just the perception of ignorance so when you wake up why don't you remember seeing ignorance you do you do that's why you say oh my god i didn't know anything i didn't know any how do you know you didn't know anything because you remember knowing nothing <laughs> you remember knowing absolutely nothing and so in the state of deep sleep that's all that happens so uh, then in uh, verse 5 it says jagare pidhiyas tushnim bhava shuddhena bhasyate divya paras chit bhasyas tira bhasena samyutaha so even in wakefulness the calm of the intellect is lit up by the pure consciousness even right now in the waking state when the mind becomes completely still in the waking state then uh, the well actually always the mind is being illuminated by the infinite consciousness but even now if we could make the mind still through meditation or through discrimination through viveka through atma vichara uh, uh, self inquiry uh, whatever the means or through japa whatever the means if the mind becomes still then uh, we realize that the mind is illuminated by the infinite consciousness so even in wakefulness the calm of the intellect is lit up by pure consciousness when the mind is still so also the activities of the intellect together with the reflected consciousness are subject to manifestation by the pure consciousness so the reflected consciousness is making my mind and body conscious but the pure consciousness is still there the pure consciousness is what i really am it's the reflected consciousness which identifies with the body and mind which says i am swami atma rupananda i was born in atlanta i'm uh, this is many years old i've lived in these places i've done these things i know this i don't know that uh but in the midst of all of that it's all illuminated by the infinite consciousness but it's the reflected consciousness which becomes involved in the body and mind and thinks that the body and mind are the conscious self that's why we think that i am this individual being but this infinite self has never left that's right there all of the time vanni taptam jalam tapa yuktam dehasya tapakam chid bhasya dhistara bhasa yuktan yam bhasa yetatha each of these verses is a wonderful verse and i'm of course just going to quickly to give you an idea of the text but uh, not uh, this is not a replacement for studying it on your own so this says that vanni taptam jalam tapa yuktam that water is heated by fire but through that heated water uh my uh, i uh, uh heat my own body if i take a bath in uh, uh, warm water my own body becomes warm because of the water but the heat is from the fire the heat doesn't belong to the water the heat was added by uh, heating the water uh and yet through that my body becomes heated and so in the same way consciousness belongs to the atman but that consciousness illuminates uh, the uh, reflected consciousness and that reflected consciousness illuminates the body and mind but consciousness doesn't belong to the body and mind that's why when the body is dead uh, when a body dies uh, you see that the person is gone they're gone now it's just a lump of flesh just a lump of flesh and even now when you go to sleep we see a person lying on bed asleep and we say they're asleep that's not the person's experience they've forgotten the the the, the body uh, they don't think oh i'm lying here on my bed asleep if you're thinking that you're not asleep <laughs> the body is gone so uh, uh water heated on fire acquires the heat and so becomes capable of heating the body in like manner the intellect illuminated by pure consciousness acquires the luster of pure consciousness and illuminates all other uh external objects uh there's a beautiful verse from the uh dakshinamurti stotra let's see if i can remember it uh 
ಸ್ನಾಚಿಂದ್ರಘಟೋದರಸ್ಥಿತ ಮಹಾದೀಪ ಪ್ರಭಾಸ್ವರ ಜ್ಞಾನ ಯು ಚಕ್ಷುರಾಕರ್ವಾರ ಬಹಿಸ್ಪಂದತೆ ಜಾನೀತಿ ತಮೇವ ಬಾಂಧಮನುಭಾತ್ಯತ್ಸಮಸ್ತ ಜಗತ್ ತಸ್ಮೈ ತೇ ತಸ್ಮೈ ತೇ That's the easy part. Now I forgot the last line, which is the repeated in all of the verses. Anyway, I'll, I'll get to the translation. Uh, the um, uh, verse says, a beautiful, the idea of the verse is beautiful, that uh, seated within a clay pot with various holes in the clay pot is a lamp. And that lamp shines out through the holes in the pot. And so the light of the self, uh, seated within each of us, shines out through the sense organs and says, Janami, I know. I know, I see, I hear, I touch, I smell, I taste. That's the light of consciousness pouring through the sense organs. But the light of consciousness is not the sense organs, just as the light in the lamp pouring through the holes in the, uh, uh, the, uh, in the, 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 holes in the vessel uh, are not the holes in the vessel. The light is independent. and yet it pours through the holes of the vessel and illuminates and so the light of consciousness pours through the body and mind and illuminates the world around us and so uh, 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 oh wait where did that go oh that was the pre- previous verse no let's see what if you the intellect of the notions of good and evil in respect to sensory service of giving them. Ah, sorry. Now why did I, how did I lose that? Let's see. Together with ignorance, because it shines upon ignorance only. Oh yeah, oh, it's all the way back to verse 3. Therefore, the supreme problem of life lies in the effort to discriminate the pure consciousness from its reflection. So the purpose of life is to know the consciousness itself, which is separate from the uh, reflection. To know that light within the clay pot uh, shining through the holes, to know that. And so water heated on fire acquires heat and so becomes capable of heating the body. In like ma- manner, the intellect, the buddhi, illuminated by pure consciousness acquires its luster through the reflected consciousness and illuminates other uh, external objects and then verse 7 says rubado guna dosha di vikalpa buddhi ga kriya ta kriya vishaya sardham bhasayanti titir mata so notions of good and evil in respect of sense objects are the creations of the intellect It is my idea of good and bad among the sense uh, objects. Uh, those are my own uh, mental uh, creations, my own uh, interpretations of experience. The pure consciousness, however, simply reveals those activities of the intellect together with the external objects. So pure consciousness just reveals. It just reveals. But then the mind interprets according to my past samskaras. I like this person. I don't like that person. I like people that look like this. I don't like people that look like that. I trust people that look like this. I'm suspicious of people that look like that. Uh, I, uh, I like t- this type of food. I don't like that type of food. I feel comfortable in this kind of weather. I uh, feel uncomfortable in that kind of weather and so forth. That's all interpretation that comes from the mind. But consciousness just illumines. And so if we want to go back to consciousness, if we want to realize ourselves as consciousness, then we have to practice that sakshi bhava, the attitude of being the witness, not getting involved in interpreting everything. Yes, we have to interpret certain things in order to live a normal life, certainly. We have to know good people from bad people, to know who to trust and not to trust, certainly. But we should be aware when we're doing that, that that is an interpretation of the experience. But consciousness itself is untouched by the good and bad of anything. Consciousness itself is just the light which illumines everything. And then eight says, Rupacca guna dosha bhyam vivikta kevala chitihi. The good and bad, uh, the, the virtues and flaws in all of the sense objects that we see, uh, those are separate from consciousness itself. 
consciousness itself is not involved in the flaws that we see in the objects. Saimana vartate rupar rasadi nam vikalmane. But consciousness is present behind all of those judgments of the mind. So the good and bad objects, uh, the good and bad virtue, or the virtues and vices of objects that we see, the good and bad qualities of things that we see, uh, those are uh, those don't touch consciousness itself. But consciousness is present. The pure consciousness is present, illuminating all of the things that we see. That's one of the virtues of the, for the, those of you who came to the meditation yesterday. Uh, I talked a little bit about mindfulness meditation and the Hindu tradition as well as the Buddhist tradition. One of the virtues of mindfulness meditation practice is that it uh, teaches you just to be aware, not to make judgments, not to think about things, but just to be aware. Uh, and so that is the nature of consciousness. So we're trying in the practice like that, trying to approximate consciousness, trying to pull back to consciousness and out of the judgments of the mind. And so now it comes to some of the uh, real contributions of this uh, text. In verse 9 it says, Chane chane anita bhuta dhivi kalpas titir natu mukta su sutra vad buddhi vikalpeshu titisthita and the next several verses I'll just sum up uh, uh, in, uh, because uh, they, uh, this is, you could say, the heart of the text. And it's these ideas that are, are its special contribution of the Lagu Vakya uh, And so I'll just talk about the ideas themselves rather than going through every verse, uh, uh, phrase by phrase. But this particular verse which introduces it says, the modification the intellect, that is our thoughts, thoughts, memories, perceptions, is in the mind, are changing from moment to moment. That we all know. The mind is changing constantly. Our th thoughts are changing constantly. Through all those modifications, thread in a string of pearls. So the mind is bubbling with activity, with thoughts, perceptions, memories, images, words, all of that bubbling up in the mind. That's what we see when we try to meditate. We find the mind just churning with activity. But through all of that, consciousness is like the thread uh, in a string of pearls. The thoughts like uh, pearls, though they don't seem so beautiful sometimes, uh, and uh, uh, consciousness as the thread which is running through those pearls. And so consciousness is present in all of the thoughts. And then it uh, goes on to say in verse 10 that the thread covered over by the pearls in a string of pearls is visible between two pearls. Between every two pearls, you see the thread. And so between every two thoughts, consciousness itself is visible. Consciousness itself is visible between every two thoughts that we have. That's an extremely important truth, and that's the real contribution of this uh, text. It was a wonderful insight of the author of this uh, text. That between every two thoughts, thoughts are momentary, as the Buddhists said. The Buddhists, uh, Buddhists said that consciousness itself is momentary because they didn't distinguish consciousness from act the mental activity, from conscious activity. Vedanta makes a fundamental uh, difference between pure consciousness, which is the light which illumines activity, and the activity itself. Otherwise, how can I, how can I know that thoughts are momentary? If I am the thoughts, if that's all that is, how do I know uh, that thoughts are momentary? I couldn't. I, I myself would be momentary, which is what the Buddhists say, uh, that everything, including I, am momentary. They even say that nirvana itself is uh, momentary, because the uh, Buddha said everything is momentary, so later Buddhist philosophers said, well, nirvana also must be momentary. Uh, it led to great complications in Buddhist philosophy. But Vedanta made this fundamental discovery at the time of the Vedas themselves. The consciousness is separate from mental activity. And so between every two thoughts, the, the author of this uh, wonderful book says, consciousness is shining through, just as the thread you can see between every two pearls. Or in a uh, japa mala, you see a rudraksha mala, for instance, you see the red thread coming through between every two rudraksha beads. 
Uh, so what does that mean? He'll tell one thing that it means as far as practice goes. Another thing that it means that he doesn't mention, but uh, which is very significant also, is that constantly this infinite consciousness is revealing itself every moment between every two thoughts. Why don't we see it? Because our thoughts are so fast. Our thoughts are so fast. It's like uh, showing a film strip. If you're showing a, a film strip, then uh, they're frame after frame being shown. But you see the movie as just one continuous uh, thing. You don't see the individual pictures. Why? Because the eye can't process uh, that quickly. So before it's processed one, it's gone to another frame. And so you get a, a sense of a continuous action on the film. But actually, they're separate still frames. A movie is made up of nothing but still frames. That's all it is, moment by moment. But the eye and the mind can't process it, quick, process it quickly enough. So it sees a blur of action, which becomes uh, a living film. And so in the mind, these thoughts are happening so quickly, we don't see the consciousness being reveal, revealed between every two thoughts. And so we don't see the reality which is being flashed in front of us every moment. But that's a very hopeful thought also that this is happening. Why is it that everything in life seems to be determined? And that's why science, uh, good science, leads to determinism, because we see that everything seems to be determined. So a scientist is led, even though many scientists don't want to be, they're led to determinism. Why? Because if everything has a cause, and everything is the effect of a cause, and you can trace the causes of everything, then really there's no freedom. There's no freedom anywhere. But we have the sense of freedom. Why? That the scientist can't explain. So the scientist says it's an illusion. The sense that you are free is an illusion. We're just basically machines, just operating uh, and thinking that we're free, but we have no freedom. I think I want to go somewhere and I think I'm free to go. Uh, no, I'm being impelled to go because of uh, uh, mental and emotional and physical conditioning. Uh, it's not a free choice at all. So there's freedom nowhere, but there is freedom. And our sense of freedom comes from that fact that this infinite free consciousness, which is absolutely free, unconditioned by anything, undetermined by anything, uncaused by anything, absolutely free and infinite, is shining forth uh, within us every moment and giving us this sense of freedom, giving us the sense that everything is not predetermined, everything is not uh, a machine-like. It's that which makes us feel that, no, I'm not a machine. I'm not a machine. Somehow I'm free, and I know that I'm free, and yet science tells me that, no, that's an illusion. And philosophy tells me it's an illusion. It's Vedanta that says, no, what you, what you feel is true. You are free. Uh, and that is constantly telling you that you're free. The idea of uh, Krishna's fruit, the music that Krishna is playing throughout the universe, calling to all souls, that's the light of the self which is shining through every, uh, between every two thoughts, shining through, giving you the sense of freedom, giving you the sense that, uh, no, I am, uh, I am being called by something. I don't know what it is, but I hear this music calling me forward. Uh, and that which leads me from life to life. I mistake it for thinking it's out there. Some of the music is coming from out there. Let me get this. Let me have that. Let me enjoy this. Let me enjoy that. Because that's uh, going to give me happiness. No. Then I realize that, no, that music is coming from inside. And so uh, uh, the uh, that light is shining through every, uh, uh, every two thoughts. The pure, undifferentiated consciousness shines forth clearly by itself in the interval of two modifications of the mind, when the preceding one has died down and another is yet to appear. So the thoughts are not continuous, they're momentary. And momentary means that they come and disappear, then another comes and disappears, another comes and disappears. But between those thoughts, there is the light of the self shining through. Persons aspiring to the experience of Brahman should therefore practice by slow degrees this restraint of modifications, starting with one moment and then extending it to two, three, and so on. So spiritual practice, meditation, japa, all of that is aimed at stilling the mind. And if we can have the mind still even for a moment, then we catch a glimpse of that infinite light. 
Sometimes in meditation, after usually after many years of meditation, sometimes we may sit and suddenly the mind becomes still. And we feel a, a blissful freedom in that stillness. It may uh, last for just a moment. But in that, we've caught a glimpse, uh, even though we may not recognize it yet, we've caught a glimpse of reality itself. Because the mind has become still just for a moment, just for a moment, and that has shined through. And uh, then he goes on in verse 13, this individual self, the jiva, which is now affected by modifications of the intellect, all of the thought activity, will in time become one with undifferentiated Brahman by realizing the truth of the Vedantic teaching, I am Brahman. That is the idea sought to be conveyed here in this treatise. So that everyone is that self and that light is shining within you every moment. It's just that we have to get the mind to settle down, get the mind to be still a little. And as we do that, we will get closer and closer to the experience of that. And when we can still the mind, even for a moment, we get a glimpse of that uh, reality. And in verse 14, he says, the reflected consciousness, though involved in the modifications of the intellect, that is the reflected consciousness, that is there's infinite consciousness and then the reflection of that in the in intellect. So that reflection is involved in the uh, modifications of the intellect is really one with the undifferentiated Brahman. The apparent modifications, which are self-evident, uh, have only to be suppressed by all effort. And so by stilling the mind, uh, then the, the infinite consciousness shines forth. The reflected consciousness is like the reflection of the sun on a pond. And when the pond is uh, wavy, it, uh, 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 you don't get a good reflection of the sun. And so the reflected consciousness is involved with the intellect and all of the thoughts that are going on and ruffling the mind, uh, those are causing us to uh, distort the image of the uh, uh, perfect self. And so the purpose of life is to come to the realization of the divinity within. And verse 15 says, if one is able to effect complete suppression of all modifications once and for all, that's a tall order, then one becomes blessed with samadhi, which is loving, lovingly cherished by all sages. That is, if the mind becomes perfectly still, that's yoga chitta vritti nirodha as Patanjali defines yoga as the cessation of all mental modifications. And that is what is uh, the ultimate samadhi, when the mind is perfectly still, and that is what is aimed at by the stages, the sages. If, however, he says, that is not possible, one should pursue with faith the effort to realize Brahmanhood by controlling the modifications, even for a moment. So even for a moment, so our task is to try to still the mind as much as we can. And again, not to directly, not by just saying, okay, I'm not going to think anything, that doesn't work. But through japa, through meditation, through prayer, everything that brings the mind uh, uh, to, towards the stillness is bringing us closer to that until that itself is revealed, because that is our own nature, as he says here, that, that experience aham brahmasmi, I am Brahman, that's the vakya, that this is the vritti of, the uh, statement of the Upanishads, that this is a commentary on aham brahmasmi. Me, I am Brahman. Having, he says in 16th verse, having comprehended the real implication of the teaching, I am Brahman, Aham Brahmasmi, a person imbued with faith should meditate unremittingly upon his identity with Brahman to the fullest extent of his capacity by means of all the faculties of the intellect attuned to that idea. So having Understood intellectually, having understood, having thought about it, understood that aham brahmasmi, I am uh, Brahman, then one should uh, meditate uh, continually on the identity with Brahman to the fullest extent of one's capacity. And then in verse 17, uh, here the Sanskrit is too beautiful not to recite. Tat chintanam, tat kathanam, tat paraspara bodhanam. Thinking of uh, meditating on that, speaking of uh, that, uh, illuminating each other on that, that is, uh, illuminating uh, uh, each other, that is, talking with the, each other about that. Etad eka paratvamcha, and having that as uh, one's uh, supreme uh, goal, brahmabhyasam vidur buddhaha, brahmabhyasam vidur buddha. That is known as the practice of Brahman by the wise. So thinking of that continually, meditating on it, uh, speaking of it, uh, illuminating each other uh, on that is a spiritual practice. 
Uh, and then the last verse, and then I'll sum up. Consummation of this practice lies in the firm conviction of one's identity of, with Brahman. So the consummation of Brahmabhyasa, practice of Brahman, is to know that I am Brahman, to have that deep conviction. Like what convic conviction is normally there in the sense of identity of the self with the body. The way that normally I think I am the body. I don't have any doubt normally. I should, but I don't. Uh, I think that I am the body. That firm conviction that uh, this, is, this is me. That firm conviction. I should have that firmness of conviction for Brahman itself, that I am Brahman itself. Uh, when I think I, I should think I am Brahman, not I am this body. You see that in people like Mahapurush Maharaj, Swami Shivananda, the disciple of Sri Ramakrishna. Uh, people would ask him in his old age when he had many physical complaints. Uh, they would ask him, Maharaj, how are you? He'd say, oh, I'm fine, I'm fine. But Maharaj, you have uh, blood pressure, uh, high, your blood pressure I heard was very high and the diabetes and all that. Oh, you mean the body? You mean the body? Oh, no, the body's not at all well, but I'm fine, I'm fine. So that identity with Brahman, that uh, that's who I am. This body, yes, it's full of aches and pains, but uh, let that go, let that go. We can't do that because we're so tied to the body, but one day we will be able to do that. And so we should know that and then uh, uh, we can aim for that. So that, uh, that is the end of the text. So let me just in conclusion uh, say uh, again, the, the value of this text, I know, every verse is worth uh, studying because you learn a lot of Vedanta just in the course of 18 uh, simple verses. And the Sanskrit, one of the wonderful things about uh, the best of these uh, Vedantic texts is that the Sanskrit is very simple. If you read the Ashtavakra Samhita, the Abhatuta Gita, the Laghuvakya Vritti, the Advaita Makaranda, and other texts, the Sanskrit is very simple. Uh, and so here also the Sanskrit is very simple, the ideas are very straightforward, but they're talking about the highest truth. So now in uh, summation, let me uh, uh, say, what does this mean to us here in our everyday practice? Uh, many, uh, many, uh, many are devotees, that is, the people who are followers of the path of devotion, some following the path of knowledge, but many who prefer the path of devotion, who worship and all of that, and that's very good. But what does a text like this mean for someone who is practicing devotion? It can mean a lot. And one can practice simple devotion of just prapatti, just to surrender to God. You don't have to bother the head with philosophy and all of these uh, physical body, subtle body, ca causal body, all of that. No, you don't need all of that if you don't want it. Uh, it's very good. If you do want it, it can be very helpful. But if you don't want it, you don't need it. You can just follow a path of simple devotion. But still, uh, if you want to understand something of uh, the, the Vedanta as a philosophy and as a path of philosophy, even though your main path is devotional, then all you have to do is to replace the idea of the self with your chosen ideal. The Sri Ramakrishna is Brahman. And the reflection of uh, uh, Sri Ramakrishna is within me. And it's that reflection, it's that reflected light from Sri Ramakrishna through which my body and mind have all of their uh, uh, appearance of consciousness. It's through that light that I do everything that I do. It's through that light that I see, through that light that I hear. That is the, that is the light within my heart. Because in the Indian thought, ancient Greek thought, American Indian thought, uh, Sufi thought, uh, uh, Christian thought uh, up until modern times, everywhere it was uh, thought that the higher mind is in the heart. And so the scientific view is, well, those stupid people, they thought, they thought that the heart was the mind, but they didn't realize it was a blood pumping organ. Well, no. They weren't talking about the physical heart which pumps the blood. But uh, one realizes the awakening of the heart means what? That the higher consciousness is here. Higher consciousness is here. Not in the fleshly organ, maybe because we're talking about something which is more subtle than the physical body. This is the gross fleshy body. But there is a subtle body which is the mental body. 
which is not visible through uh, the sense organs or through a microscope. And so in the same place here uh, is the higher awareness. And so my chosen ideal, Sri Ramakrishna or Sri Krishna or the Divine Mother, or Kali, Durga, Saraswati, uh, they are reflected uh, in the Buddha and it's their light through which I see. And uh, uh, it's through their light uh, that I act. And so I'm just the instrument. I am the house. I'm the ghor, I'm the house, you are the indweller in the house. I am the, the yantra, I am the machine, you are the yantri, you are the operator of the machine. Uh, I'm just uh, a pencil in the hand of a writer, and the Divine Mother is the writer who's using me to write to the story of this world, this little part of the story. And uh, so it's very easy to see these texts from a devotional standpoint also. And to know that ultimately I'll realize that uh, I and mother are one. I was never separated from mother. I only dreamt that I was separated from mother. I was never separated from Takur. I only dreamt that I was separated. Uh, the Takur's play is manifesting through all of these forms, including this form. Uh, and so let me enjoy the play because one day I'll find that that light which I am, that comes from him. And I too will go back to him. I too will go back to her. Uh, that light uh, will go back to its uh, source, which is that infinite consciousness being reflected in the mind and operating through the, uh, the mind and uh, sense organs. And uh, so uh, let me surrender to that light. Let me surrender to that light. So when I pray to him or when I pray to her, I'm praying to that infinite light, which is the one light of the universe known as the Self by the Vedantins, known as uh, the Divine Mother by the Shaktas, known as Sri Krishna, Sri Ram, and Vishnu by the Vaishnavas, known as Shiva by the Shaivas, as Christ, the light of Christ by the Christians, uh, Allah by the uh, Muslims, as uh, uh, various names in various traditions. That is the one light which illumines the hearts of all. And I am one with that light. So uh, whether I think of it in terms of I am the reflected light and that is the infinite light and I worship that, or if I think in terms of the jnani that I am that light, I'm not this body and not this mind, I am that light. Either way, I come back to the source of all light uh, and uh, understand uh, how that is functioning through all of these reflected particles of light. Everywhere, all of these reflections of light everywhere, which I see darkly, I see dimly, as if I'm wearing sunglasses all of the time. But as the mind becomes pure, as the mind becomes more pure, as the mind becomes more still, then everything begins to seem full of light. Everything begins to seem full of consciousness. Everything begins to seem uh, sparkling with uh, the radiance of God. And so that's where we want to go. So whether I think that I am that, I am that, Aham Brahmasmi, or whether I think uh, you alone, O oh Lord, you alone, O oh Mother, you are everything, and I am simply a wave on your ocean, or I am simply a reflection of your light. Either way, we come to the same thing. So with that, I'll stop here. And let me give, I've already gone a little over time, so let me, I won't take questions today. I apologize for that. Let me uh, give a closing chant and then announcements. Om Madhu Vataritayate Madhu Ksharanti Sindhavaha Madhvir Nasantoshadhi Madhu Nattamutoshasi Madhu Mat Parthiva Gum Rajaha Madhu Dyorastuna Pita Madhu Mando Vanaspatir Madhu Magum Mastu Suryaha Madhvir Gavo Bhavandunaha Om Madhu Om Madhu Om Madhu For us who seek the truth and for all living beings, may the winds blow sweetly. May the rivers flow sweetly. May the herbs yield us sweetness. Sweet be the night and the break of day. 
sweet be the very dust of the earth. May the heavens pour down sweetness upon us. May the trees, lords of the forest, bear us sweetness. May the sun shed its sweetness upon us. May all the directions pour forth sweetness. Oh, sweetness, sweetness, sweetness. So for uh, announcements,